I'd like to read a quote to you. I'm hesitant to ask you to shout your answer. I don't want to put anybody in an awkward spot, so I might just ask you to think about what's being said here and consider, is this true or is it not? And then I'll give you my, uh, my thoughts on it. But there was someone speaking at a church several years ago here in the United States, and uh, this is what they said. I just want to encourage every one of us to realize that when we obey God, we're not doing it for God. I mean, that's one way to look at it. But we're doing it for ourselves. Because God takes pleasure when we are happy. That's the thing that gives Him the greatest joy this morning. So I want you to know this morning, just do good for your own self. Do good because God wants you to be happy. When you come to church and you worship Him, you're not doing it for God really. You're doing it for yourself. Because that is what makes God happy. I was trying to hold back from gagging there. I'm sorry. My breakfast was about to come up. I think that kind of gives it away. That's, that's false. You know, that's not, that's not even false. That's blasphemous is what that is. And so doing what we do, not for God, but for ourselves, um, no. But unfortunately, if we're honest with ourselves, many people, many Christians, this is exactly how we function whether we realize it or whether we would say it or not, it's our motivation. Our service to God, our worship, our church attendance is always through the filter of what's going to make me happy, what's going to fulfill me, right? And so we got to check our hearts. We have to check our hearts. What is our motivation for why we do what we do? Is it for the glory of God? Is it for the honor of His name? Is it for the edification of other people? Or is it for my own personal satisfaction and happiness? something that we really have to think through. Now, I've said this before, and I will say it again. First, you know, let me just ask the question, is, is God's goal ultimately our happiness? Is that what God is after? Is that what makes God happy, our happiness? Well, I've said it before, and I'll say it again. God's goal is God's glory, ultimately, the honor and the glory of His own name. That is the highest priority. That is what God is about. And God is greatly glorified in our holiness, in the holiness of His people. When we reflect God's goodness and God's holiness and God's character, God is glorified, and I believe that is what makes God happy. Amen? Therefore, I would say what makes God happy is our holiness. I would say God is far more concerned with our holiness than He is with our happiness. Far more concerned with that. Now listen, I am not saying that it is God's desire that we be a bunch of miserable wretches. Okay? I don't think God takes joy in that. I don't think God delights in that at all. That we would just be a bunch of unhappy people moping around. That is not God's goal. Jesus Himself said, Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. Jesus said, blessed are those who hear the word of God and keep it. You know what that word blessed is? Happy. That's what the word means. Happy. Happy are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness because God is going to fill them with good things. Happy are those who hear the word of God and keep it. And so I do believe that God is concerned to some degree with our happiness to be sure because, look, I don't think it has to be one at the expense of the other. It's not happiness or holiness. And some people kind of have that false dichotomy. That, that's not it. It's not one at the expense of the other. We can have both. We can be both blessed, happy, and holy. There is joy and holiness, and God is well pleased with that. God is well pleased by that. And that's really the context of the message that we're looking at today. So I, uh, we put a little, you know thumbnail out uh, for the message this week, and it was, what makes God happy, is the question. And I've answered it. I, I believe it's our holiness. But I would say that if I were to summarize the text that we are in today and will be in for the next couple of weeks, I would summarize it as this, pleasing God through holy living. Pleasing God through holy living. 
So you may be wondering, what exactly is holiness? That's a word that we use a lot. Have you ever really stopped to consider what it actually means? Because I think we understand it in very general terms, and oftentimes it's very synonymous with other things like good or, or righteous or pure. And there is some of that to be sure, but there's even more to it than that. So let me just say, my uh, introduction here is a little lengthier than normal, and so don't worry, I'm going to compensate, and the message when we get there will be a little shorter, okay? Deal? So don't, don't panic. Don't, by the time I get there, I'll be like, oh my goodness, you know, that was a 30-minute introduction. Um, but what we're going to be talking about in the text here, there was so much that I wanted to say, and I thought it would be better to just frame today's message and to just start with trying to unpack what holiness is. If it is so important, if it is something that is so important to God and important for us, we should really get rid of some misconceptions and try to understand what it actually is. And then we will get into the text. And I believe this will be the key to unlock and really help us better dig into the text that is before us today. So let's start with what holiness is not. Let's start with what holiness is not. Misconceptions on holiness. If you've ever heard the book, The Pursuit of Holiness by Jerry Bridges, I, I can't encourage you enough to read that book. Short chapters, action-packed. I've read it several times. It's a must-read. The Pursuit of Holiness by Jerry Bridges. And in that book, he says, the concept of holiness may seem a bit archaic to our current generation. To some minds, the very word holiness brings images of bund hair, long skirts, and black stockings. To others, the idea is associated with a repugnant, holier-than-thou attitude. Yet holiness is very much a scriptural idea. You understand the holier-than-thou. He kind of used the, the word to explain his definition. That's not good. But it means this arrogant kind of like, I do this, why don't you? I don't do those things, why do you do those things? And kind of looking down, we understand that. That's, and I think oftentimes that's what people think when they hear holy, either some kind of, you know, dress code or, or that smug attitude. Bridges goes on to say the idea of exactly how to be holy has suffered from many false concepts. In some circles, holiness is equated with a series of specific prohibitions, usually in such areas as smoking, drinking, dancing. The list of prohibitions varies depending on the group. So I know all about this. I didn't really grow up as a Christian, but I, was, I grew up in a place where there were a lot of Christians, and they were very like fundamentalist, ultra-conservative. And my understanding of Christianity was men's haircut has to be three-quarters of an inch above the ears, no mustache, no beard. Women have to wear skirts all the time. You can't go to a restaurant that has a bar in it. You can't go to the movie store. You can't listen to music that has drums or guitars. You're a compromiser if you do. On and on and on the list goes. And you cannot hang out with people that do those things. And then if those people hang out with somebody else who does those things, you can't hang out with them. And so separation is a huge part of that whole world. And so a lot of people think that's what holiness is, right? Bridges goes on to say that when we follow this approach to holiness, we are in danger of becoming like the Pharisees with their endless list of trivial do's and don'ts and their self-righteous attitude. And for still others, it means unattainable perfection. I think that's what a lot of people really think. It's unattainable perfection. This is an idea that fosters either delusion or discouragement about one's sin, end quote. And that's what it boils down to. If you think holiness is this unattainable perfection, you're either going to have dis delusion or discouragement. You are either going to think that you are that good, you're going to be delusional. In your mind, you are that holy. That's a problem. That's a real problem. Some people, they're in that place. And essentially what they're doing is, is they're minimizing what sin actually is. I heard a guy say on YouTube one time, he's like, I haven't sinned in seven years seven years. And you know why the key to this is because he, well, I struggle, you know, but I don't sin anymore. And it's like, okay, so you have redefined sin. And so delusional, or there's discouragement because we know we sin. We know that, the, that sin is something that we battle with daily. And so if you think that holiness is perfection, 
then you are going to be constantly discouraged because you know that there is this infinite chasm between you and the standard that you have set, right? Which leads to despair, discouragement. And so we have to watch out for that. That is not what holiness is. So if that's not what holiness is, what is holiness? What is it exactly? Well, I'll give you a little bit of an illustration and then a definition and then another illustration. I think, first off, the word itself, holiness, it means separate. That's what it means. Set apart. Distinctly different. That's what holy means. And God is holy. And you know how God said that you shall have no graven images? That is to say that no one could fashion a God. They could not take and make a figurine that was supposed to represent God, as the cultures often did in their pagan idolatry. They would make all of these little grotesque statues and images and figurines out of precious metals or wood or what have you. And God said, don't ever do that to me because you cannot capture all that God is in any image. He is incomprehensible. If, if you were to be able to capture one, one particular aspect of God's character or nature, that is to the neglect of all of the other. And so God said, don't even try. There is no one like me. There is nothing like me in all the earth. So don't try to make some physical representation of me. Does that make sense? That's kind of the idea of holiness. God is so, so far apart from all things. He is so very different. He is so uniquely distinct that he said, don't even try to, to make an image of me. That, that's kind of the essence of holiness. Now, Richard Mayhew, he wrote this uh, book, Biblical Doctrine, spectacular book, and he gives us a definition of God's holiness. He gives us a very robust theological definition, so try to track with me here. He says, God's holiness is his inherent and absolute greatness in which he is perfectly distinct above everything outside himself and is absolutely morally separate from sin. So it's the distinctness of God. He is totally distinct from anything and everything. And as a result, he is morally separated from sin. He goes on to say, God resists all compromise of his character and therefore is transcendently distinct from all his creatures in infinite majesty. So God resists all compromise to his character. God will always be consistent with his own character. You ever seen somebody who is mild-tempered, very soft-spoken, and then they lose their temper and lash out at somebody, and you're kind of shocked by that. You think, wow, I, that was out of character. I wouldn't have expected that. That can never be said of God. God is so holy, he is always consistent with his own character, and he, he resists and rejects all compromise towards his own character. He's transcendently distinct. He goes on to say, since God is inherently great and therefore transcendently distinct from everything outside himself, he is certainly separate from sin, being morally and ethically perfect, hating sin and demanding purity in his moral creatures. So really the, the overarching idea is being different, being distinct, being set apart. And because that is God and he is light, he is also absolutely set apart from anything wicked, any kind of sin. He is, he is perfect morally. And so, obviously, that is God, and we can never be that. And we're not expected to be that. But we are called to holiness. That's a frightening thing. When you consider the holiness of God in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 15, it says, "...but as He who called you is holy..." You also be holy in all your conduct, because it is written, Be holy, for I am holy. So we're called to be holy. Now, it doesn't say be holy as God is holy. We can't be holy like God. It just is not possible. But as we serve a holy God, we are to make every effort to live holy lives. And God gives us His Spirit so that we can do just that. But holiness is the aim. So let me try to bring this down just a little bit and maybe give us another example in the Bible of what holiness actually looks like. And I think a great example of this is the children of Israel. Now, were they perfect? The children of Israel, did they do it all right? Absolutely not. They did not. But they were holy to the Lord. 
And so you have these people, they were in bondage in Egypt for 400 years. Now, Egypt was a wicked place full of idolatry and worship of false gods. On and on it went. And they were immersed in that. They were in that culture for 400 years. And then God takes them out of Egypt and He takes them in to conquer the Canaan, the land of Canaan, which was also inhabited by all kinds of wicked pagan idolatry. Just the most heinous, gross stuff. And God knew that it was going to be uh, a real battle for them and that they were going to really have to fight against not being pulled into those cultures and tainted by the idolatry and sin of those cultures. So God called them out. He separated His people from all of these other peoples and He gave them His law. He gave them His holy law that they were to obey and in so doing, they were going to be so very different from all of the other cultures. Whether it was civil law or dietary law or moral law, they were to be different in every way. They were holy unto the Lord. And then God says this, Deuteronomy 14.2, actually Moses speaking, He says, For you are a holy people to the Lord your God. And the Lord has chosen you to be a people for Himself, a special treasure above all the peoples who are on the face of the earth. So that really captures for us the essence of holiness. You are a people who have been called out of the world and called to God. You are His special people, a special treasure for God, distinct from and above all the other peoples of the earth. You are holy. And so the idea of coming out from the world and, and, and coming to God, that is holiness. In fact, the, here where it says that they are the special treasure, the King James Version uh, renders that peculiar people. They were to be a peculiar people. They were to be very different. They weren't to be like the rest of the world. They were to stand out, stark contrast. You guys tracking with me? You understand what I'm saying about holiness? Holiness is not, I'm better than you. Holiness is not, do this and don't do that. Holiness is not, for us, moral perfection, though that is God. Holiness for us is being distinct, being different coming out from the world and and giving ourselves to God and walking in His ways and reflecting God's goodness, His character, His glory to the world. That's holiness. God is calling us to Himself to be a peculiar people, to be different, a people that reflects the God that they claim to know and that resists the pervasive influences of the world. Now, this does not mean isolation from the world. This doesn't mean holy huddles. It doesn't mean that we go join a monastery and get involved in all kinds of monkery. All right? (laughs) That's not what this means. All right? We're in the world. We love the people that are in the world. We do our best to reflect the love of of Christ and the holiness of God to, to these folks while we are living in the world. We are to model for them something that is distinctly different. So brothers and sisters, what this world desperately needs is a holy church filled with holy Christians. What this world does not need is a church that looks just like the world. Now a lot of people in the world are all up in arms and they are demanding that we look like them and think like them and act like them. But quite frankly, the world and the people in the world know that the world is broken. Deep down, they're looking for something different. They're looking for some kind of hope. And that shines most brightly when we are a holy church in the midst of an unholy world. And so we must resist the temptation to let down our guards and to stop fighting the fight for holiness and to just join hands with the world and and to let our light begin to dim gradually and to start looking and acting and thinking more and more like the, the world that rejects God. We cannot do that. And so we're going to see in our text today that holiness is what pleases God and is what God wills for our lives. How's that for an introduction? Yeah. I'll pick up the pace. <laughs> Only two points. Only two points today. We'll move through the first point pretty quickly, and then we will... Uh, get into the, uh, the second point a little more. So if you have your Bibles, 
Let's read this text together. Would you stand with me for a moment? Let's just stand, stretch your legs, jog in place maybe, and uh, we'll read this text. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 1 through 8. It says, Finally then, brethren, we urge and exhort in the Lord Jesus that you should abound more and more just as you receive from us how you ought to walk and to please God. For you know what commandments we gave you through the Lord Jesus. For this is the will of God, your sanctification, that you should abstain from sexual immorality, that each of you should know how to possess his own vessel in sanctification and honor, not in passion of lust like the Gentiles who do not know God, that no one should take advantage of and defraud his brother in this matter, because the Lord is the avenger of all such." as we also forewarned you and testified. For God did not call us to uncleanness, but in holiness. Therefore, he who rejects this does not reject man, but God who has given us his Holy Spirit. May God bless his word. As I said, pleasing God through holy living. And I would say point one, pleasing God is the priority for the follower of Christ. That's the priority. Pleasing God is the priority for the follower of Christ. Verses 1 and 2 here. He says, Finally then, brethren, we urge and exhort in the Lord Jesus that you should abound more and more, just as you receive from us how you ought to walk and to please God. For you know what commandments we gave you through the Lord Jesus Christ. So he says, Finally then, brethren. I love this, finally, because... He's getting to the point now in chapter 4. So it took him three chapters to finally get to the point of his writing this book here. So after having said all of that, finally, here we go. And so notice he says, brethren. Now this is significant. Uh, In the Greek, this is adelphoi. It's the plural form, and it means brothers and sisters. That's significant. We should note that. The word comes up again a little later in the text, and again, it is brothers and sisters. So Paul is making it clear here. This is a message that is given to both men and women. And so, but the, the, the language here, it, it says brethren. And in most English translations, some, some render it brothers and sisters uh, more accurately. So he says, brothers and sisters, you know what commandments we gave you through the Lord Jesus Christ. So you'll recall Paul had been there in their midst for a short period of time. And God used him mightily, and then God moved him on. He had to leave abruptly, maybe three weeks, four, five, six weeks, but he had to go. And so he says, brothers and sisters, you know the commands that we gave you in the Lord Jesus. So first off, let me just say this. I think this is probably a good place to stop and just acknowledge Paul is talking to Christians. Paul is talking to Christians. And so I would be doing you a real disservice by trying to convince someone in here who maybe doesn't know the Lord that you can be holy or should be holy. Because the Bible is crystal clear, you cannot, outside of a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. That is the starting point. And everything that we do is from that place. We don't pursue holiness so that we can get right with God. That's a terrible place to be. Right? And the scriptures are very clear that we come to, to God in faith. We come to Christ and we, we call upon his name for salvation. And then we're born again. And as we're born again, holiness becomes the very thing that we desire. Outside of Christ, we may look at holiness as, you know, just not something that we really care about, not something that we necessarily want to, to be about, but we have to if we're going to, you know, make it to heaven one day. And that's just a miserable way of approaching it. When you come to Christ, God gives you a brand new heart, and within your heart is born this desire for righteousness, for goodness, for faithfulness, for holiness. And so that's the starting point. You have to know Jesus Christ savingly you have to recognize that you have blown it and we all in this room know that we have blown it amen we continue i'm sorry that wasn't i'm not convinced do you know that you have blown it like i know i have blown it amen okay we we do it's just the way that it is 
And so we recognize that there is a holy God who has not blown it ever. He is fiercely holy. And we have to stand before that God one day and give an account for all the ways in which we have blown it. And so the good news is, is that God in His grace and in His mercy, He paid the price for us. He sent His Son Jesus to live the life that we could not live. He never blew it. Perfect obedience to God's law on every single point. And then He willingly laid His life down as a sacrifice, and He died in our stead. He paid the penalty. The, the, the penalty for our sin was placed upon Jesus Christ, the spotless Lamb of God. And, and God's wrath was poured out on Him on that cursed tree, that rugged cross. And He died for those sins. And then He rose again from the grave, vindicated, declaring victory over sin, that God approved His sacrifice. It was acceptable, well-pleasing. And now, because of that, we can be forgiven. That could be your sin there on that cross, washed and forgiven. If you would only acknowledge that I have sinned, I have fallen short of the glorious standard of God, and I need God's forgiveness. I know that I stand condemned, accountable to a holy God. If you confess your sin, that you have sinned, and you confess your belief that Jesus is who He says He is, and that He did what He said He did, and that He rose from the grave for you, and you surrender to Him, you will be forgiven. You will be cleansed. You will be made brand new, born again, filled with the Holy Spirit, radically changed from the inside out. God is no longer a judge. God is your Father. God is your Father. And Jesus is your Savior and your Lord and your friend and your brother. And so that's the good news of the Gospel. And it starts right there. There is no holiness outside of that. It starts right there, and that's exactly who Paul is talking to, brothers and sisters. This is a reminder and a reaffirmation of the things that he had told them while he was there. And Paul gave them clear-cut and authoritative commands in Jesus. He said, we exhort you in the Lord Jesus. And that's what it is to be a follower, folks. That's what we signed up for, keeping the commands of our Lord Jesus Christ, living for Him, doing what He told us to do, honoring His name, serving Him. Paul reminds them of that. And he says, just as we commanded you when you are there in the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, he says, you have received from us how you ought to walk and to please God. You received it. They received it. That word means to open your heart and to open your arms. And so when Paul came there with the gospel, they received the gospel. They opened their heart to the truth of the gospel. They received it. And then as he began to teach them and disciple them and give them the commands of Christ, they received that too. And those commandments are good. They're not a burden. By those commands, we learn how to walk and to please God. And that's exactly what Paul says there. You receive from us how to walk and how to please God. How to live one's life and how to honor God. How to bring joy and pleasure to the heart of the Father. How to walk and to please God. That's the motivation for what we do. You know that? It is to walk with God and to please God. For instance, you know, in, mar in marriage counseling, a lot of times the first thing that a counselor will say is, are you willing to do whatever it takes to glorify God? And second to that, are you willing to do whatever the Bible says that you need to do? You know, if, if you're not willing to do that, if you're not willing to do whatever it takes to honor God and you're not willing to submit to the Bible in this regard, then there's no point in even proceeding if you're looking for biblical counseling, right? And that's, that's it. That's the goal of the Christian life, to walk with God and to please God, to know God and to love God. Amen? And Paul reminds them of this. And he says, look, guys, you're doing it. You're doing these things. And now I want you to do it even more, 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 more. Remember I told you that's the, kind of the theme of the book here. He says, finally, you remember everything we told you? You're doing it? Now do it more. Keep moving forward. Paul said, we urge you in the Lord Jesus. We urge you. That's an interesting word. This word is, is to ask on special footing. Uh, it, it means intimacy. It carries uh, the idea of intimacy. It's, it's uh, such requesting receives special consideration because of the special relationship involved. 
And what is the relationship? Their relationship with Jesus. He says, we urge you in who? In the Lord Jesus. And that's who Paul is appealing to here. That's the authority that he comes with. Based on your love for Jesus Christ. Based on your relationship with Jesus Christ. Based on the intimacy that you have with Him. I want you to just go even farther into this thing. I want you to excel more and more in these things. And now Paul is going to go on to specify exactly what it is that he would have them abound in. <laughs> Holiness. And so that brings us to point number two. So point number one was pleasing God is the priority of the Christian. Say that with me. Pleasing God is the priority of the Christian. Point number one. Point number two, holiness in the Christian is the priority of God. Say that with me. Holiness in the Christian is the priority for God. That's God's priority. Our priority is to please God. God's priority is that we would be holy. Does that make sense? And so verse 3, he actually gets into this. He says, verse 3, For this is the will of God, your sanctification, that you should abstain from sexual immorality. So when you hear this phrase, this is the will of God, that should cause your ears to perk up a little bit. I've heard that there are some 23 times in the New Testament where you'll find this phrase or something similar to it. We really want to know the will of God, don't we? Do you agonize over the will of God in your life? I know that, I mean, maybe there are seasons when we don't, but generally speaking, we're always agonizing. God, would you have me to date this person? God, would you have me to take this job? God, would you have me to do this, that? And we're always trying to figure out, God, would you have me move to this place over here? Uh, we're always trying to figure out in very practical terms, what is it that God would have us do? God, what is your will? Well, the Scriptures are actually quite specific about what God's will is. And most often, it deals with issues of godly living. And I believe that is far more important to God than just the practical things. Not to say that those things aren't important, because God is intimately involved in those things. God has a plan. God has a will. But you know how Jesus said that, Seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and all these things will be added to you? Remember that? I think the same thing applies. If we are far more concerned with God's will in matters of godliness and holiness and we're aggressively aiming at those things, all the other stuff is going to work its way out. God's going to get you there. He's going to lead you directly into His will and all those practical things that we agonize over. You aren't even going to know how you got there. And so this is it. When the Bible says this is the will of God, that is where we need to Per ears up, listening, paying attention. And what is it? What is God's will? Sanctification. Now, that's a big Bible word, but that is the same word for holiness. Same word. It comes from a root word, hagios. There are other words, and we'll talk about that, that stem back to that same word. That is God's will for us. Holiness. Sanctification. Being set apart. And there are really two different aspects to this. There is a positional sense where it's done. We are holy. And you're not going to change in this. You're not going to be more holy one day and less holy on, on another day. It is fixed. And we see that in 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Paul is talking to the Corinthians. Now, did the Corinthian church have it all together? Did they? Yes or no? They did not, just like the children of Israel. Yet, Paul could say this to them in chapter 1, verse 2, to the church of God, which is at Corinth, to those who are sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints, with all who in every place call on the name of Jesus Christ our Lord. That word saints, same word. And so you are sanctified, you are called out, you are called to God, it is who you are. And you are a saint because of that. Now, how many of us in here feel like saints today? If we're honest, we feel like ain'ts more time than not. Right? But Paul said that if you are in Christ, you are a saint. You have been sanctified, and it is a done deal. And that's why is that so important to the Christian? Because, Christian, that is how God sees you. Now, I know how you might see yourself, and I know how I see myself on most days, but it's not the way God sees us. 
God sees us as sanctified, as holy, as saved, as washed, as children. And it's, it's a done deal. That does not change. Now, our feelings change. Our feelings change with the minute. But our position does not. And whether we are having a great day and we're keeping all our rules or we're having a terrible day and we're not, we're not managing to do any of our, our, you know, what we kind of make our little standard, we're sanctified. We're in Christ. And that doesn't change. So that's important. You've got to have that. You've got to have that. But there is also what is the practical side of it. And there's another usage of this word, and it's practical sanctification. And that is the word that we have in our text here. And it's far less, it's, it's rarer that you would find the, the word sanctified in the practical sense. There's only a few usages of it, and it's right here. And Paul says, this is the will of God, your sanctification. Sanctification in what? Sexual immorality. And so sexual purity. I'm going to talk about this more in depth next week. Uh, I'm going to actually come back and just kind of address that issue. Um, I'm not excited about it. Uh, I'm a, kind of a bashful guy, but I'm going to deal with it. Because most people, when they talk about the issue of, of sexual sin, their reasoning is basically, it's just bad, okay? It's bad, and let's move on. Or, you know, there's just all of these misconceptions about that and biblically. And so uh, I'm going to come back to that next week, and we're going to deal with that, um, you know, the, the, whole, the whole issue. Uh, but for today, I'm just going to kind of keep it more general, and I'm going to stick a little more closely to just the issue of holiness. Now, here in the text, he is uh, specifically talking about sexual purity in the church. And to have holiness in regard to that particular area. So verse 4, he says that each of you should know how to possess his own vessel in sanctification and honor, not in passion of lust like the Gentiles who do not know God. So Paul says every one of you has a responsibility to exercise self-control. Before God, we all have that responsibility. We have to possess our own vessel. In sanctification, there's that word again, and in honor. We are not to be controlled by passion and lust. Now, the word passion here, it means uncontrollable desires, compelling feelings, overpowering urges. And I think we all know something about that. And that that is certainly true within the context of, of sexual purity, but it also works its way out into all kinds of other areas overpowering urges, uncontrollable desires. The word lust here refers to out-of-control cravings, usually for that which is unrighteous or illegitimate. And so Paul says that we are to possess our vessels in honor, our bodies. We are not to be given to these out-of-control desires and these ungodly cravings. He says, instead, your body, your vessel, it is to be a vessel of honor. And in 2 Timothy chapter 2, Paul uses just very similar language. He says this in verse 20, But in a great house there are not only vessels of gold and silver, but also of wood and clay, some for honor and some for dishonor. Therefore, if anyone cleanses himself from the latter, he will be a vessel for honor, sanctified. There's our word. Sanctified and useful for the master, prepared for every good work. And so Paul is saying we need to be a clean vessel. We need to be a pure vessel that is fit for God's use, that is set apart, that is sanctified. You've heard me use the analogy before of like a pig slop bucket. I used to live on a farm, and we'd have the bucket that was always being filled up with scraps to feed pigs. Well, you know, if you come to my house, I'm not going to pull out the slop bucket and start feeding you, right? That's nasty, okay? That's... That's a vessel of dishonor. We, that, that was us. That was us outside of Christ. But we've been cleansed in Christ, and now we are vessels of honor. So we're not to look like that. We're not to live like that. We are to be clean, and we are to be useful. 
so that we can serve the Lord with a clean conscience and so that God can use us mightily so that we're not hindered or disqualified because of sin. And that's what it boils right down to, folks. When we are unholy, when we are given to unholy things, we affect the ability with which God can use us. Do you want to be used by God? I want to be used by God. I want to be used by God. And when there are things in my life that get in the way of that, i got to get rid of it. we got to get rid of it. We have to be vessels of honor. Vessels of honor. And notice that Paul contrasts those who possess their vessels in honor with the Gentiles who do not know God. And so, note that holiness is what? It's a distinction. It's to be different. And Paul said that there are the pagan idolaters who are given to gross and rampant sexual immorality. You have to look different than that, than that church. That can't be happening in the church, Paul is saying. That may be what's going on in all the pagan temples around you where you're living as you are in this sin-filled, wicked society. You, however, have to look different than that. And that... You know, sexual immorality was a real part of pagan worship. And it was, it was a, a very real part of, of going to the temple and engaging and quote-unquote worship to whatever deity that they had. And so Paul said, look, that's not you. You've been cleansed from that. And God's will for you is sanctification, that you would be holy and, and be a clean vessel. And so you have to abstain from that. You have to resist that. You're not to be given to those urges and lusts. Look, we know what the heat of passion is, right? Things, horrible things happen in the heat of passion. Murder, so on and so forth. A, a decision is made in a moment that affects our lives for the rest of our lives. That's what lust, that's what unchecked, uncontrollable urge does to a person on some level. And Paul says, that's not you, okay? That was how you used to live. That was how you used to govern your life but not anymore. You've been cleansed. You've been forgiven. You've been filled with the Spirit of God. You're different. You're new. And so you tracking with me, guys? You see what I'm saying about the distinction? You know what holiness is? It's to be separate, set apart, set apart to God, to look like Christ, to reflect God's character and, and goodness and, and glory. I want to um, read couple of verses to you where we see this very thing. And I just want to show you from the New Testament that this is a very real, this is a very real uh, part of the New Testament writings. Paul, when he's writing to the believers in Corinth, in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, Paul is making this distinction between light and darkness. And he says, what fellowship has light with darkness? What communion has Christ with Belial or Satan, you know, what part has a believer with an unbeliever? There should be some kind of distinction. There should be some kind of discernible reality that, that differentiates between the two. And he says, what agreement has the temple of God with idols? And he says this, for you are the temple of the living God. Listen to me, folks. You are the temple of the living God. As God has said, I will dwell in them and walk among them. I will be their God and they shall be my people. Therefore, come out from among them and be separate, says the Lord. I will be a father to you, and you shall be my sons and daughters, says the Lord Almighty. Do you hear that language there? There's a distinction here. There's a separation that has to happen. There has to be some way to be able to tell the difference between one group and another. We are to be a holy people. The same thing in Ephesians chapter 5, Paul says... Therefore, be imitators of God as dear children and walk in love as Christ also loved us and has given himself for us an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet smelling aroma. So that's Christ. See what Christ has done for us and we're to be imitators of God as dear children. But then he goes on to say, but fornication, uncleanness, covetousness, let it not even be named among you as is fitting for the saints. Neither filthiness nor foolish talking, coarse jesting, so on and so forth. He says, put all of that away. Instead, be known for giving of thanks. You know, let that be the thing that comes out of, out of our mouths. He says, let no one empty you, uh, deceive you with empty words. Because of these things, the wrath of God comes upon them. 
Verse 7, do not be partakers with them. Verse 8, for you were once darkness, but you are now light. You hear that? You were once darkness, but what? You are now light. You hear that? You see, you see the, what, the consistency here and all the things we're looking at? There's this distinction to be made. There has to be this distinction. Well, he goes on in verse 6. Paul's going to tell them, look, that we are accountable to God in this matter. We're accountable to God. Verse 6, it says that no one should take advantage of and defraud his brother in this matter because the Lord is the avenger of all such, as we also forewarned you and testified. And so Paul says, in the church, we cannot be taking advantage of each other in this matter. And there, that word brother there, again, brothers and sisters. And so within the church, and this kind of stuff can happen. And we read in the headlines frequently when stuff gets sideways in churches with pastors, so on and so forth. It's a horrible thing. And Paul addresses that. He says, let no one take advantage of or defraud his brother or sister in this matter, the matter of sexual immorality. He says, because the Lord is the avenger of that. So the, the word take advantage here, it's to sin against, to transgress, to cross a line, to go too far. And then the defraud here, one commentator says, defraud means to selfishly, greedily take something for personal gain and pleasure at someone else's expense. Whenever believers seek to satisfy their physical desires and gain sexual pleasure at the expense of another believer, they have violated this command. And so we are accountable to God to be pure, to be holy. And God chastens, He chastens His own in such matters. I mean, because think about this. For one, you have a son or a daughter of God who's being defrauded in this way. You think God takes, takes that lightly? No, He does not. And on the other hand, we know that the Bible says that God chastens His sons and daughters and here for taking advantage of others. And so this is a serious matter, holiness in this regard. And so we have to walk in holiness. And this, folks, goes in our thinking. I, I would say most of us in here are probably doing a great job with outwardly, externally being holy in this area. But how's your thought life? What are you taking in? What are you watching? Right? Right? This is something that we have to be dead serious about. It says that God is the avenger of those who are defrauded in this matter. So look, verse 7. And this is the motivation right here, folks. This, I think this is such a great motivation for us. It says, For God did not call us to uncleanness, but in holiness. The word call here, it's a very strong word. It's usually described for God calling somebody into salvation. And he says, God did not save us to live unclean lives. God didn't do that. God called us out of darkness into the light that we would live, what? Holy lives. I remember when I first became a believer, I was at um, a faith-based uh, rehab, and you weren't allowed to smoke. And I had professed faith in Christ like my first or second day in, but I had made up my mind I would smoke as soon as I got the opportunity and I did, right? And then all of a sudden, man, this thought crossed my mind. I came here because I wanted to change my life. And this is that old behavior, that lying, you know, being sneaky, breaking the rules. That's the old man. And that was like a light bulb moment for me. That was when I knew God's doing something in me. God's changing my heart. And that, that's that holiness unto the Lord, you know, God didn't save us so that we could just living, keep living like we used to live. You with me? God called us so that we would live lives of holiness unto Him. So do you ever take inventory of how you may be lacking in, these, in this area? You guys ever take inventory in your own lives? I mean, most of us in here, if I were to ask you, I mean, you probably already have a running list in your head of all the things that you struggle with or wish that you didn't have going on in your lives, but we, we do. We have a lot of these, these areas. I just know for me, something as simple as YouTube. I mean, I like to watch political stuff, and it gets me mad. I like to watch documentary stuff about stuff that's going on around other parts of the world, and it is dark, and it's, you know, 
uh, inevitably, it's very graphic, and there's language that comes out, you know, and you're interested to see what's going on in different cultures and wars and all these different things, but it's, it just kind of vexes your spirit. And, you know, the, like, you ever seen those instant karma videos where some person does some stupid, you know, obnoxious thing and then gets, like, knocked out? or something, you know, and you're like, yes! I mean, that's like the righteousness in us just yearns for justice. And that person got served. But inevitably, like, it's, it starts going, getting pretty bad, you know, and you're like, why am I watching this, you know? And so it's like things even, even like that. What are we taking in, you know? What are we being entertained by? What are we filling our brains with? How, how is it affecting us? Has the Lord been convicting you lately in any particular area? Because he's calling us to holiness. And, and this brings us to the last verse here. And this is the good news, folks. Therefore, he who rejects this does not reject man, but God who has given us his Holy Spirit. So this is a command from God. Paul says if you reject it, you reject God. But here's the good news. God has given us the means to obey. God has given us the power. He says here, God has given us his Holy Spirit. Do you hear what's, what's being said here? This is fascinating to me. You know, we talk about being filled with the Spirit and the fruits of the Spirit. Has it ever entered into your mind that one of those fruits should be holiness because He is the Holy Spirit? And so He's calling them to holiness, and then He says, God gives you His Holy Spirit. So we are equipped, folks. In Christ, we have what we need for holy living because we have the very Holy Spirit of God living within us. Is that amazing? There's this prayer, St. Augustine, um, early on in church history, uh, fourth, fourth century, is that right? Okay, my wife would know these things. Um, fourth century, he, he has this prayer, and it says, Grant what thou dost command, and command what thou wilt. I love that. You know, God, give me the ability to do whatever you want, and then command me to do it. You know, God, give me the ability to do your will and then show me your will. And God has done that. God says, be holy as I am holy, and I'm giving you my Holy Spirit so that you can do just that. That's our good God. He gives us the ability to do it. He gives us the desire to do it. And so may holiness to the Lord be the longing of our hearts. May holiness unto the Lord be the pursuit of our lives. Thank God above all that we have Christ Jesus who is God's holiness for us. Who is God's holiness in us. Because we fail to be holy oftentimes, do we not? But thank God that even when we fail, there is one, our great champion, who has, who has succeeded in every way. He is truly the victor. He is truly our holy and righteous king. He is our holiness. And so we must run to him we must run to Him, thank Him, thank Jesus that, that He is our righteousness, that He is our holiness. And if you don't know Jesus, before you leave here today, I am pleading with you, come talk to me. Talk to me, talk to one of the, somebody else in this room, but we, wanna, we want to connect you to Him. We want to see you come to a saving relationship with Jesus Christ. We want to see that, that hunger and that thirst for holiness and righteousness to abound from your innermost being and we want to see the joy in your life that comes from knowing that God's going to fill you with good things. Isn't that what we want? Isn't that what we need? I'm going, to, I'm going to close us out in prayer, and I will pray for us to that end. Lord God, we love you. We praise your holy name. We thank you so much for your kindness. And Lord, I just cry out, we need holiness. Thank you that you've given us your Holy Spirit. May we be different, Father. May there be something about us that is unique, that is peculiar, something that stands out, something that shines like a light on a hill, something that reflects your goodness, your character, your glory. May you be glorified through holy living. May you be glorified through a holy church. And I just pray for everybody in this room, including myself. We need you, Lord. We need your strength, we need your love, we need your guidance, we need your spirit. And may we be a people who are holy as you are holy. And thank you, Father, in Jesus' name, amen.